Hey, it's Emma. Get ready for me to tell you yet another reason why we cannot trust our government. 2020 sucks. What happened a long, long time ago? Oh, <laughs> it sucked then too. Everything sucks all the time. Here's a funny podcast about it. <laughs> right. right. Hi, this is Jolie. I am using these recorded podcast episodes as an excuse to practice not looking like I'm a five-year-old when I put on makeup. So as you know, Jolie, I was, you know, one day going really deep on Britney Spears because her Instagram is just so weird. It's horrifying. (laughs) It is. It's like really upsetting and sad and something's definitely going on with her and it's upsetting and I'm super consumed in it. But yeah, anyway, I went so, so hard with this, like reading about Britney and I actually like got off social media temporarily. I'm not using Instagram or Facebook in part because I was like obsessing over Britney Spears stuff. Oh. Um, but also like about a bunch of other stuff, like just like politics stuff. Like it's just, it's been like too much. Yeah. My screen time report went down by 40%. Holy Isn't that insane? shit. I once yeah. joked that infinite scroll ruins my fucking life, but I totally believe that. <laughs> oh, well, I feel so much better. I mean, I'm not using Instagram or Facebook. You know, and it's like, I feel like I can stay more present in the moment. And anyway, whatever. Nobody cares about your Instagram, Emma. I mean, like you're real pretty, but like, who cares? (laughs) Tell me about mind control. Okay. Yeah. So I ended up- Not like like Instagram has anything to do with mind control at all. (laughs) I know, right? Okay. Long story. So- We're talking about MKUltra today. I first started hearing about it because I watched this like weird YouTube documentary film called Out of Shadows. And that's like all about like the Hollywood elite or like them doing like Satan stuff and like eating cakes that look like people and like just like weird shit. And they talked about MK Ultra, And then like that night you and me were texting and I was like going down this whole rabbit hole and like just like on Reddit and just like reading dumb shit. And then I came across that whole like Baron Trump time travel shit. That's a fantastic conspiracy theory. It's, I mean, have you read it? No. The, okay. So basically there's a story that was written in like the 1900s or something called like Little Baron Trump and his time travel machine or like some what? shit. I don't remember. You should look into it. It's really interesting. And they are like talking about this thing called Goggle, but it like sort of sounds like Google. how somebody who doesn't understand what the internet is would like describe Google and That's yeah. And bonkers. then just like different stuff. It's Then there's like another book that like has something to do with it called The Last President. And it's like, it's just fucking weird. You should look into it. There's not that much though. I'm you know, so scared, like, Emma. Oh, it freaked me out. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that like, if it's all real, I will like I will be freaked out. I'm usually not freaked out by conspiracy theories. I'm just like, yeah, yeah, people are reptiles, whatever. And I had first read about it a few years ago. I saw it on Facebook and I'm like, yeah, whatever. But I went down that like super deep hole and I'm like reading about that and like a common thing in all these like Reddit threads. MK Ultra like kept coming up. It's kind of like tinfoil hat, like explanation for everything. Right. You know, just like, oh, like, well, you know, and I think part of the reason why people go to it is because it is something real that was like a big betrayal to our own humans. people and other people and <laughs> yeah to, to humans like something that was super fucked up not okay to do but it's real and it's proven and the files have been declassified before we talk really about mk ultra and what it is i just want to um just share a couple of things that i found that are other like fucked up things that we've done for science i'm so excited <laughs> <laughs> Well, so it's like, you know, there's testing on animals. That shit's fucked up. There's also testing on people. And it happened a lot more recently than I feel comfortable with. In the 1940s, the U.S. Public Health Service was infecting Guatemalan prisoners, mental health patients, and soldiers with different STDs. (sighs) Then it's like science has had all sorts of ethical breaches. And it's all with, you know, vulnerable populations. You know, people that are like... People who "Uh." can't say no and have people listen to them. 100%. Yeah, that happened in Guatemala in the 40s. And then here in the U.S. from 1932 all the way to 1972, which, I mean, just think about it. That's not that long ago. There was the Tuskegee syphilis study. This is all black men. Mm -hmm. And they were recruited to, like, figure out what happens with untreated syphilis. So the only information. (laughs) Well, yeah. And also, like, during this time period, they discovered that penicillin would be a treatment. And even though these people had been infected, they never gave it to them. And they were told that they were going to get free health care. Oh, 
my God. Then the Willowbrook hepatitis studies is another one I read about. And that was children in mental hospitals that were all intentionally given hepatitis, trying to like figure out like what the infection does. And I don't know like if it was A, B or C, you know, maybe C. It seems like that's the one that's the worst. I Holy think. shit. Yeah. And that study lasted for 14 years. Oh, like, my it wasn't just God. like. Mm-hmm. And that's such a painful disease. Yeah. That's a horrible way to die. Yeah. It's fucked up. And it's like they're already mentally ill, like as if adding. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Like, geez, they're please. in institutions. Life is already not great. Let's just make it worse. So the last one that I I wrote down, and I'm sure there's like way more fucked up things scientists have done to people, especially like in marginalized communities and stuff. But I didn't want to go too hard on this because I have a lot of other cool stuff to say. But there was also the Jewish chronic disease hospital studies that started in 1963. And like super old patients were told they were in a research study, but they were actually being injected with cancer cells to like find out what the immune reaction would be. And oh, my God. Yeah. So it's like elderly Jews, mentally ill people black oh, people you know, brown people just like it's fucked up so yay science Woo-hoo. advances <laughs> every day mk ultra is like essentially a continuation of like nazi work work that began in japanese and nazi concentration camps nazi doctors did all sorts of like crazy stuff but they also focused on mescaline experiments they were giving people mescaline i think in order to like lower inhibition and like try to get information out of them oh okay like a kind of truth serum Yeah, like a kind of true serum. And that was basically like what RCIA's objective was. So they ended up having Nazi doctors come to the U.S. to teach them their ways. Are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, our CIA actually hired these people who had worked in Japanese and Nazi concentration camps to come here and explain like what they found out through using uh, Mexicans. (laughs) Mescaline. (laughs) And like what they could do to build on that research. Yeah. So this was like during the Cold War times. Like I think it actually was like a little bit after the Cold War ended or like towards the end of everything. We were afraid of the Soviets, the Chinese, of North Korea. And I guess there was an idea that prisoners of war were being brainwashed. Yeah. Um, Yeah. So they're like, okay, you're brainwashing our people. Like we need to figure out what the fuck you're doing because they were scared. You know, and I think like prisoners of war were turning, but I think they were turning because they were being like tortured to, you know. (laughs) Yeah, it's like you actually don't have to work that hard to change somebody's mind so that they can stay alive and not get beaten every day. Right. Well, it's not even mind control. It's just like it's just scaring them to a normal response to that kind of awful treatment. But anyway, so that is how MKUltra became a thing. We were afraid. We wanted to brainwash people. We're like, yay, Nazis, show us all the evil that you can do (laughs) so that we can do it too. Well, and you know, that's like something super freaky that from all these conspiracy videos I've been watching is that like a lot of our government like came from Germany. Like they're actual like Nazis that like started the CIA or like. What the fuck? I am already horrified. So let's just make me more (laughs) horrified. (laughs) <laughs> At the time, the director of the CIA, his name was Alan Dules, D-U-L-L-E-S. He's the one who was, he approved the new program. Okay, so the purpose of the program was to perform experiments on human subjects. And more often than not, these subjects did not know that they were participating in experiments. And the whole point was to assess the potential use of LSD for mind control, information gathering, and psychological torture. I like that they just went ahead and said it. Like, we're going to psychologically torture some people. Just in case you thought that we were against torture, we're not. Right. We're way interested in it. (laughs) But this was, it was like super top secret. So it's like the director of the, the CIA approved this and then... There was this man, his name's Sidney Gottlieb, and he's the man in charge of running MK Ultra. And then he had another boss whose name I don't I don't know right this second, but we're gonna get into it because I talk a lot about Sydney. This is just sort of like we're just like getting there. Just dipping our toes into the awful. <laughs> yeah. Over time, under Sidney Gottlieb's control, there was more than 150 experiments done. And as I said, sometimes the test subjects didn't know they were participating in a study and they still didn't know even as the drugs were like starting to affect them. Oh my God. Um, so they just thought they were going crazy. Or, or something. I mean, I don't know. I've taken my fair share of hallucinogens, specifically LSD. And I couldn't imagine. I mean, and they're not just giving people like a hit of acid. Like they're like dosing them, fucking them up. Right. You know, I don't want to like get too ahead of myself because it's like, stuff I'm going to talk about later, but it's not like they were just like dosing them once and then like that was it. Like these people were 
kept there for days and days and days. And and it's like at some point you probably lose all of your sense of reality. Right. You know, holy shit. I've never just had someone dose me before secretly. No, that would be horrible. You don't do that to people Uh uh-uh. for but just C- this reason. <laughs> so the CIA did. <laughs> evidently, like, I don't know if this is real or not, but evidently Sidney Gottlieb and MK Ultra and the CIA, like, all together paid $240,000 to buy all of the LSD in the world. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if that's a fact or not. Don't you just make LSD? Yeah. I mean, it seems like they were more than willing to pay a whole bunch of fucking Nazis. They couldn't pay, like, one goddamn hippie right. to make them a whole bunch of LSD. <laughs> Well, this is in the 50s. This was way before oh. this whole, the whole. Were, were, were they greasers? I guess so. Along with the LSD, they also used other hallucinogens too. They did electroshocks, hypnosis, sensory deprivation, isolation, verbal and sexual abuse, as well as other forms of torture. What? So when they said psychological torture, they meant like just torture in general. Mm-hmm. There's this man named Stephen Kinzer who wrote a book called Poisoner in Chief, which is about MK Ultra and Sidney Gottlieb. He says Gottlieb wanted to create a way to seize control of people's minds, and he realized it was a two part process. First, you had to blast away the existing mind. Second, you had to find a way to insert a new mind into that resulting void. We didn't get too far on number two, but he did a lot of work on number one. Kind of sums it up. Really? So let's learn a little oh. bit about this guy. Sidney Gottlieb. He was born on August 3rd, 1918. He was an American chemist and spy master. He's like the master of the spies. Um, I want that on my resume. Podcast host, spy master. (laughs) He's like, these are two things that will not help me in this retail position. And in fact, make (laughs) me a super creep. I am going to be real weird to the clients. He joined the CIA in 1951 as a poison expert, um, and he headed the chemical division of the technical service staff. Yeah, so he just, like, helped make poisons, helped do, like, mind control shit. In 1953, he became the head of MK Ultra. He just did a lot of terrible stuff. I mean, for, like, 20-plus years, he was part of these, like, special interrogation programs where he temporarily and kind of permanently fucked people up. Oh, my God. Yeah. That um, does not look good on your resume, by the way. It's kind of interesting. It's like, what the fuck is the CIA anyway? They do some stuff that makes sense to me because we need to know like what's happening in North Korea and like what's happening in Russia and they're going to be spies and all that mm-hmm. shit kind of makes sense because like, yeah. you know, federal protection and all that. Mm-hmm. But like this shit, I'm just like, what the fuck are you doing? Mm-hmm. Like this is beyond awful. You're actively trying to figure out how to torture people into believing whatever you want. Well, and it's sort of like I don't even think they ended up using these techniques that they learned. So they just fucked up a whole lot of lives for absolutely nothing. I mean, it's good that they didn't fuck up more lives, but shit. Yeah, like some of the stuff I was reading is just terrible, like with the poison department and stuff. (laughs) I work in the poison department at the CIA. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think that's what it's called, poison division. That doesn't sound any better. But it's like there'd be biological agents, you know, chemical warfare, like that they test on animals and like a successful day is like showing up to your office and them all being dead. Fuck. Yeah, really heavy. You're like learning about there was some studies about what's sarin chemical agent, even getting just a little tiny drop on you has the potential to kill you. And like those things had to be tested on people, I believe. There was like a threshold like, well, how much can we use or not use and still get the same effects? Oh my it's fucked up. God, how do you live um, with yourself if you have to do that shit? My job uh, is to torture and kill people. How was your day? <laughs> right? I know. You come home. You're like, hey, babe, what's up? What'd you do today? Oh, you know, like 30 monkeys died. So it was a good day. <laughs> Whatever. It's like, what the fuck? We learned that arsenic is, in fact, very poisonous. Like, well, you already knew that. <laughs> right? Oh, uh, no shit. Now it's like a little bit off topic, but it's kind of interesting just about the $240,000 that was spent on LSD. So, I mean, this was in the 50s, early 50s. And like, there wasn't the whole like sexual, like free love LSD rev- revolution. But in some ways, Sidney Gottlieb is sort of like the person who made this happen. He's like the unwitting godfather of LSD counterculture. And it's just it's just so ironic. He wanted everybody to take LSD to have their minds controlled. (laughs) And then everybody took LSD and was like, you can't control my mind. I'm free, (laughs) man. Yeah. Yeah. So (laughs) government sucks. Oh, shit. We did it wrong. We did it wrong. (laughs) Wrong drug. Wrong drug. We should have stuck with masculine. Maybe you have to be in like a really chaotic room with someone shouting at you in German before you like really get the mind control thing. There was some shit like that. People like being put to sleep 
for like long periods of time and like them playing like weird shit on repeat in the background. Like, but these are like being asleep for like a month or something. Good God. You know, and then like you're just like hearing this like. That is so fucked up. Yeah, the CIA is weird. So unrelated to um, MK Ultra, Stanley Gottlieb also was trying to figure out how to kill Fidel Castro. In 1960, he proposed to spray Fidel Castro's TV with LSD and put thallium all over his shoes so that his beard would fall out. So I guess that was just to make him crazy. Like, my beard's falling out. My TV is trippy. And then he also had plans to assassinate him. Uh, One of them was using a poison cigar or a poison wetsuit or an exploding conch shell is one that I love. An exploding conch shell yeah i love it here you can hear the ocean oh shit (laughs) right (laughs) up to your ear (laughs) it's funny or a poisonous fountain pen and he also was part of the cia's attempt to assassinate prime minister patrice lumumba of the congo he was also like interested in contaminating some iraqi general with botulism no wonder people hate us (laughs) (laughs) right i know Exploding conch shells, poison. Yeah, it's weird. LSD TVs. I would pay for that. I would pay good right? money for that. Right? Woo. <laughs> Let's watch TV, girls. Mommy loves you. Oh my gosh, right? <laughs> so yeah, Sydney Gottlieb. They called him the black sorcerer. There's a bunch of different kinds of testing that went on in the US, in Canada, and then just in other places like Europe and Asia and I think South America too. All of these were secret at the time. Like barely anybody knew that this was going on. It was like top, top secret. And then like in the 70s, like I think it was 1974, some shit happened. And then the CIA had to release all of this paperwork and they had already tried to get rid of a bunch of it, but somehow they didn't get rid of all of it. And then all this stuff came to light. Like different laws were passed because of this about like people needing to know what's happening to them, you know, informed consent. You know, there used to not be laws for our government agencies and informed consent, but now there is. I can't believe they had to like have a conversation about that. Like, hey, should we tell these motherfuckers that we're doing shit to them? They, (laughs) I mean, this is no excuse at all, you know, but these were like expendable people. Well, that's like what they called them. I actually have that in quotes, like right here about the secret detention centers. Basically like officers in Europe and Asia were just capturing enemy agents and people who they thought were expendable. So these people would be grabbed by these CIA officers, thrown into cells, and they would test all kinds of stuff on them, like different drugs, electroshock, extremes of temperature, which I found alarming, sensory isolation. Ugh. And all the meantime, they were just like bombarding them with questions because these were like our enemies. So it's like oh they just God. wanted to like break down resistance, destroy their ego. I, I guess what I don't understand about this whole sort of method is like you're really just getting them to say what you want to hear. They're not going to give you any information that you didn't make them give you. It's wrong to do that to people who are actively trying to hurt us. Mm-hmm. You shouldn't. There's no reason for that ever. Mm-mm. Like nobody deserves to be tortured. I yeah. mean, I have my moments where I definitely think certain people should be tortured. Yeah. But that's like for very specific crimes. Yeah, I feel you. It's not just like you're a communist. It's like you did something so revolting and horrible that I think you deserve to get it well, back. Yeah, like those parents of Gabriel Fernandez. Yeah, I would love to be in a room alone with them, like strapped to a chair where I can just have some time. That's where I become a complete hypocrite where I'm like, okay, when you are hurting children or animals or mentally ill people, people who can't vouch for themselves, you deserve to be tortured back. Eye for an eye, bitch. Yeah, it's not like (laughs) that for me for like just simple murder for some reason. I'm just like, well, you deserve to be locked in a box. And to have no freedoms, but... Yeah, not to be, like, (laughs) tortured. But if you're, like, hurting kids, especially hurting kids and animals, I'm just like, what the fuck Mm -hmm. is wrong with you? Like, you're not a person. There's something innately upsetting about your whole endealment. Yeah, the the (laughs) animal stuff is pretty weird, too. Like, that. did you you see Don't Fuck With Cats? I can't watch it. Oh, my God. Someone told me about the first of it, and I was like, I can't even do it. I just can't. If I get a mental image, I can't get rid of it. I saw one thing scrolling through Facebook, and it still pops up in my head, and I have such a hard time with it. It's an interesting story because it's sort of like, did the people on the internet cause him to commit eventually murder of a human because, like, he was getting so much attention? Oh. Because he, like, wanted to be a model. You know, and he had like right. all these like casting things and like just ne- never really got it and like was doing all sorts of weird shit. But also it's like people who do that usually do end up moving on to something that like that's why 
what bothers mm-hmm. me about people who hurt children and animals is that that's usually a precursor to something that's going to happen that's really fucking mm-hmm. bad that mm-hmm. nobody is going to walk away from. Especially when you look at cases like uh, Ear, like Easteria Rapist, or mm-hmm. like that man killed multiple people. He wasn't just raping. Yeah. That's usually the start of something. When you mm-hmm. are actively visiting like that kind of violence on other people, you're well, going to move be, on. I think you stop seeing people as humans. And I feel like that's what these these scientists and, and people needed to do. They had to like devalue certain lives to be uh-huh. able to do their like work. Because mm-hmm. it's not like they were they were doing these sort of tests and just like leaving them alone. You know, like they had to interact with these people and like watch them lose their mind. So let's talk about Canada. And you had mentioned that that's what you had heard about, about yeah. MK Ultra that you knew about the Canadian studies, I guess. Studies <laughs> yeah, I and, guess. and then subsequent lawsuits. Yeah. So people did end up suing because it really fucked them up. The British psychiatrist Donald Ewan Cameron created something called psychic driving, which you know what? I probably should have read about because I have it in quotes here, but I don't know what the fuck it is. Um, and the CIA was like, oh, that's interesting. Cool. Um, I, so his initial goal, <laughs> yeah, right? I like that. His initial goal was to correct schizophrenia by replacing existing memories and I guess like triggers and stuff with a new reprogrammed psyche. So Because that's how that works. Good <laughs> idea, bad thing. But it seems like he at least had good intentions. Like it wasn't to like torture people. It was like to maybe help the tortured be less tortured. Right. He started working in Montreal at the Allen Memorial Institute of McGill University. And he was paid a lot of fucking money. He made $69,000 from 1957 and 1964. But like in our money, that's like, you know, $550,000. Holy shit. And that's how much he was paid to carry out some MK Ultra experiments. And they're called the Montreal experiments. He didn't only use LSD, but he was using different paralytic drugs and doing electroconvulsive therapy. And he wasn't just like giving people these regular shocks, but he was shocking them at 30 to 40 times regular power. How is he not killing people? He was killing people. And I'm not sure how many people really died, but I think they wanted to find out what the what the actual threshold was. How high is too high? But they would you have know, had like, to kill so many fucking people to realize like, oh, we should probably stop doing that one. I'm sure they did. I think they killed a lot of people. I read a quote that was something like, you know, we don't know how many lives were shattered or how many lives were lost, but, you know, it's definitely too many. How many they did directly and how many were indirectly killed by them in their experiments? Because people committed suicide. Yeah, people committed suicide. The people who were participating in, (laughs) participating, I'll put in very loose quotes, (laughs) quotes, <laughs> uh, were people that came into this institute, you know, this mental hospital for really small problems, you know, like anxiety disorders, postpartum. And obviously they left these hospitals with, you know, much worse problems. So yeah, this is where they were doing those drug induced comas that I was talking about. Mm. So they were put in these drug induced comas for weeks at a time. In one case, it was three months where they were just playing tape loops of noise or simple repetitive statements. People became unable to like control their bowels people forgot how to speak in general like not just their language like they just didn't know how to talk anymore they forgot who their parents were and started to believe that the people interrogating them were their parents in the 80s a bunch of his former patients actually sued the cia for damages i'm not really sure how that went but i'm sure these people got settlements they got settlements but it from what i understand it was like not what they should have paid. It was like a hundred and something thousand dollars per patient who was still oh, alive. And they had yeah. to be able to prove that they had been experimented on. Oh my God. And since like a lot of these documents were burnt or whatever the fuck they did with them. Right. Yeah. So you want to know something super fucked up is during this time period where Dr. Cameron was doing all these experiments, he became the first chairman of the World Psychiatric Association. <laughs> Uh, and also was the president of both the American and Canadian Psychiatric Association. That is so fucked. When you see a psychiatrist, you're not like handing your life over to somebody. That's an exaggeration. If you're going into like an inpatient treatment, like trying to get like balanced or like put in a healthy state, 
Mm-hmm. Like you're not expecting to be held prisoner and put in a coma for three months and told that your dad has been raping you. One of the stories on a documentary that I watched on, I think it's CBC is the network, yeah. the Canadian network. Um, about this, about the Montreal yeah. experience. So that's actually where I, I heard about the like settlement and all of that is by watching this documentary because I love CBC. It's like one of my favorite and they have like a channel on YouTube so you can watch for free. But yeah, this one lady said she went in for postpartum, just very simple, like, hey, I'm real sad all the time. I just mm-hmm. had a baby and I can't really connect. And then uh, she went in for inpatient. Doctor said, hey, we've got this program that I think would really help you. And they convinced her that her father had been raping her her entire life and that her mother had let it happen. So she oh had zero connection with her daughter, zero connection with her family. And now she, even though she knows it's not true, she still has a hard time trusting them. Yeah, I think we talked about this when we were talking about NLP. Yeah, I mean, this is like that on like steroids. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty fucked up. But I guess what I was saying, it's like even just taking like a like a regular medication, it's like affecting your brain chemistry and like you need to trust somebody and like to know in the back of your head that like the person who is the president of these associations is also running a program to like torture people and learn how to brainwash them is pretty scary. I mean, <laughs> don't psychiatrists have to have to say do no harm as well? Like I feel like that's a yeah. thing that like if you are an MD or a doctor that Mm -hmm. works in like some sort of physical or mental health, you have to say that. Mm -hmm. That's the oath that you take. Not to say like an oath is magic or anything. It's not going to make people do stuff. But like, Jesus Christ, this is clearly Mm -hmm. harm. Okay. Yeah. So there's Gail Kastner, who was a patient and she was a 19 years old, a nursing student, and she just had depression. She had been treated with repeated electroshock therapy, being one of these test subjects, and she left sucking her thumb, talking like a baby, and had no more childhood memories. She was never told like the intentions or aims or anything about the study, and she ended up being like fucked up for the rest of her life. You know, it's like I was saying, it's like she went to the Allen Memorial Institute to be cured, but instead she was medically tortured for like a long period of time. Like for when simple in their depression. Depress- yeah, and comes out sucking her thumb, like being a baby. Like it's complete regression. Uh-huh. I mean, it's just really important for there to be like a, a system of checks and balances, you know, because MK Ultra, like really, like the types of things they were doing to other people and the permissions they were given, like there wasn't people really watching. I read that Sidney Gottlieb only had to check in with his boss. Like there wasn't anybody else he was checking in with. Speaking of Dr. Cameron, at the Nuremberg trials, he did assessments of Nazi defendants to like make sure that they were like fit. Well, I question his judgment already. Right. So I don't feel good about. Well, it's the same shit that he was doing. You know what I mean? Like these Nazi doctors were performing medical experiments without the subject's (sighs) consent. You know, he was like, those guys suck. But listen, I've got this new thing. (laughs) His experiments were the same fucking thing. Exactly. Ruining people's lives for like military gain. So let's talk about America. This shit happened here too. It was in April of 1953 that the CIA began doing this here, giving mental patients, prisoners, drug addicts, sex workers, drugs. They started giving them LSD. I guess one CIA officer said, people who could not fight back, like you were saying before. Oh, yeah. He said it yeah. out loud with his own mouth. I know. I wonder if he realized how fucked up it was when he like said it like, oh, shit. Right. Like, you know I how know. you make a joke and you're like, mm, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. Right, right. Scratch that. That was a bad taste. Bad taste. (laughs) I don't want to say that with my face. Oh, my God. I know I do that shit too much. I'm like, oh, that was inappropriate. (laughs) Okay, so some stuff about the U.S. I mean, they were doing similar stuff, obviously, here. Sidney Gottlieb also, like, wanted LSD to be able to be used covertly in order to, like, mess up a meeting or a speech or you know what I mean it's like somebody important has to give a speech they're like oh well let's dose him and then he's gonna look like an idiot and whatever oh my god so that goes into like the celebrity mk ultra sort of right. conspiracy it's like anytime somebody like acts weird that's it it's their programming they're glitching oh my god which isn't exactly how the program work it's not like in zoolander or whatever how like he goes to the spa but That is like something in our media that is like referring to this program and they're like making a joke about it and it's like in pop culture so that we're just like, yeah, that's normal, whatever. (laughs) Sure. Brainwashing. We've all been there. Totally. I go to a day spa for what is he? He's at the day spa for like a month or something. Right. Comes out and to kill the prime minister. (laughs) 
Because I guess that's sort of what one of the goals was, like not only to brainwash people or, you know, get information, but also like to create essentially like a robot person who like just goes to sleep, wakes up, murders somebody and then like Or isn't that like the born identity too? Wasn't he like? I know you're going to find this unbelievable, but I have literally never seen any of those movies. Really? Really. But I think it's the same sort of thing where it's like he has all these like skills and he was like works for the government. And And then he's like, who am I? Yeah. Who (laughs) am I? Why do I know how to murder people? (laughs) Whatever. I don't know. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of where all like the conspiracy theories come in and also how I how I ended up getting here because I was just like I, the, the world is so fucked up right now. I'm just so consumed in conspiracy theories like it's my cope. It's like a coping mechanism. Oh, my gosh. Do you but feel anyway. comforted by it or do you feel like it's making you more like scared? Because um, I know some people find comfort like solace and feeling like they know what's going on or like they have in, an excuse for what's going on. In some ways, I find comfort in it. Because it's almost like some stuff is so batshit crazy to me that like these totally insane reasonings for them make more sense and are easier for me to swallow than like, no, the world is just fucked up. You know, always has been, always will be. Right. So it's like easier for me to be like, yeah, these people were kidnapped and brainwashed. And, you know, if we just take care of this, everything's going to be fine. You guys, Kanye West's like nervous breakdown has been like. Oh, my God. That is deeply upsetting. He's mentally ill. He's so mentally ill. Uh, you know, but people will also be like, oh, well, you know. See? Programming. That shit has been stressing me out. I don't know. I hope he gets the help he needs. Me too. And what really kills me is that everyone makes a joke out of, like, him running for president or, like, him doing something weird on TV or, like, being ultra fucking dramatic about Mm -hmm. some random fucking thing or, like, his ego. And I feel like some of those things are just his natural personality. And that's totally, like, we're dope and we do dope things. Like, that's his personality where you're just like, God, man, (laughs) take it down a notch. But, like, him kind of, like, going back and forth on, like, helping Trump and then not helping Trump and then doing, you know, completely erratic things that people can't see. Like he has bipolar. He's having a hard time. Like, do you not get how dangerous this is for him personally? I don't think he has bipolar two. Like, I think he has bipolar one because like his- Is that like the worst one? If you have bipolar two, you only go from like depressed to hypomanic. But if you're bipolar one, like you have true- mania oh my god and it seems like he does because he has like these like really grandiose ideas i'm no doctor right he doesn't seem in touch with reality at all no something's wrong and like i think his family is worried about him yeah they tried to have him committed he actually went on Uh like a weird twitter tangent about it i know i i read it and i listened to his speech that speech he gave in south carolina where he's like crying and like (sighs) but so yeah it's like that shit happens in the media and then i'm just like I'm going on Reddit. And you- <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? <laughs> Help. <laughs> it's KanyeOK.com. Right. What about Brittany? Help. <laughs> it's just yes or no. And it <laughs> mostly says no lately. <laughs> that would be a great website. It's so funny. Maybe I should just make it. You should. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, back to my really interesting research. He wanted to like use LSD covertly, secret dosing. And because there was a difference in like having test subjects like in a lab, taking the drug, even if he was surprising them in the lab, there's a difference with surprising people in real life. Right. So he started doing that. He started giving LSD to people in normal settings without warning. Oh my God. It's crazy. A typical experiment was just two people in a room and they would like observe each other for hours and took notes. And then like as the experimenting progressed, there came a time where outsiders were drugged with no explanation at all. This is a quote, surprise acid trips became something of an occupational hazard among CIA operatives. (laughs) I'm going to close my whole face against that. (laughs) It's pretty crazy, right? They're just like, well, I might get drugged tonight if I don't come home. It's because my boss drugged me again. Tell our daughter, I'm sorry, I missed her birthday in advance. (laughs) People like didn't really know what this was. It wasn't like this like cool, fun drug. Like I would have thought that I was going crazy if I had no concept of what LSD Uh was before I took it. Yeah. So that actually happened to one operative. This guy had his morning coffee dosed and he lost his shit 
and was like running all across D.C., said that he was seeing a monster passing by in every car. There's another CIA employee named Frank Olson, who I'm going to talk about him a lot, but I just want to finish about the Americans before we get into it. But just remember, the CIA was like secretly drugging their own employees. Oh, I won't forget. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So there was other experiments where people were given LSD without their knowledge and they would interrogate them under like super bright lights and have like doctors and like important looking people there. Oh like my taking, God. taking notes. Oh. They were using the drug as like a threat. Like if you don't answer us, we're going to make this last longer. The people who Have are being you ever inter- ordered a pizza while you're high? Oh my God. I mean, honest to God, it is the worst. You feel like everybody is looking at you and there's literally just one guy with a pizza waiting for you to sign a piece of paper. <laughs> you're like, oh and you're God. like, <laughs> they've tapped. They know. They know. Everybody know. knows. Act Dude, that normal. happens to me even when I'm stoned. I'll like order groceries or something. I'm like, I don't, I can't answer the door. I'm going to leave the money here. <laughs> don't look at me. <laughs> Slide it under the door. <laughs> but the people who were being interrogated like this were like military personnel. Oh, my God. Other CIA employees. So, you know, people were fucked up for a long time. People died. They also were using, people uh, died. Whatever. <laughs> On with my story. <laughs> it just, it's just heavy. It's like, that's what this whole thing is. Oh, this right. happened in Canada. People died. This happened in America. People died. They did this insane. You know Guess what, I mean? what happened just next? Like, people went crazy. They died. <laughs> um, so yeah, in the US, they also used a barbiturate and amphetamine IV combo, which so they would like use a barbiturate to like knock them out. And then once they were like kind of sleepy, then they'd shoot them up with amphetamines. And during that period of time, they start babbling and stuff and they would like ask questions. They also experimented with heroin, morphine, temazepam, which I'm guessing must be like benzos because it's like lorazepam. Yeah. So that has to be like a Xanax kind of thing. Right. Something. Mescaline, psilocybin, scopolamine. I don't know what that is. (sighs) Yeah. Cannabis, alcohol, sodium, pentanol or something like that. The true serum, essentially. Yeah. And yeah, this is all Which does not work. (laughs) None of this shit works. I mean, I guess getting someone drunk, you could get a lot of good information from them. Getting someone stoned, I don't think so. Yeah. I took mescaline once. I don't think you would have gotten much truth from me then. I think if somebody started questioning me, I would have just freaked out. (laughs) Anytime I've been high, I've just like said the weirdest shit. Like I would have been telling the truth the entire time. But anything that you got out of me would be like, what the fuck are you talking about again? (laughs) Right. How did you get there? (laughs) <laughs> babysit uh, me help right help me. <laughs> i'm so thirsty oh my skin <laughs> right it's fucking terrible like it's like funny to like make jokes about but then when you actually like think about it it's like not funny no it would be horrible like i, I would not want to be dosed without knowing that i was going to be dosed so in 1954, there was a an operation set up for MK Ultra in the United States called Operation Midnight Climax. Um, <laughs> yeah, so the CIA set up several brothels within agency safe houses in San Francisco, in Marin County, and New York City. Oh my and God. they had prostitutes that are actually on the CIA's payroll, and they would lure clients back to the safe houses. And when they got there, they'd dose them with acid. Like the whole point was like they'd get these people, and you know there were people that they were like suspicious of or right. wanted information from. The whole hope was like that these men would feel too embarrassed to say that they went home with a prostitute or whatever that they would never bring it up oh Um, yeah right (laughs) yeah so the brothels had one-way mirrors and all the sessions were filmed and like this is just super fucked up because it's like sexual blackmail yeah and i guess like operation midnight climax had like super like barely any oversight at all in later interviews the agents involved admitted that it was just kind of like a party they're just kind of like woo let's like capture people and drug them and like suck and whatever oh my god we know that a lot of people did this against their will but there was also people who did this as volunteers. The Unabomber was a volunteer in these studies. Ted Kaczynski. What? Uh Uh-huh. Robert Hunter, who was a Grateful Dead lyricist. Allen Ginsberg, the poet. James Joseph Whitey Bulger, 
the yeah the, yeah the gangsta. Yeah. So he, you know, he was a prisoner who thought he was an experiment for schizophrenia. They gave him acid every day for more than a year. Then he realized that this had nothing to do with schizophrenia <laughs> and that he was a guinea pig and he was super pissed off. And he said, I was in prison for committing a crime, but they committed a greater crime on me. Yeah. He wanted to like kill a doctor in Atlanta who did this to him. I mean, a greater crime. Yeah. Right. I don't know. You killed so many people. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why you were in prison. <laughs> right? I know. But I mean, he still must lied to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's still fucked up no matter who you do it to. But it's like a greater crime. Come on now. So Ken Kesey, the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, he also was a volunteer. Wow. Um, while he was a student at Stanford. And then he started doing those like acid test parties which was like the hippie psychedelic yeah. party is listening to the Grateful Dead and painting with black light paint and shit. Universities and stuff that were doing these programs oftentimes didn't realize that these studies were for the reasons why the CIA was using them. Oftentimes these studies were funded by like front organizations mm-hmm. that were actually the CIA. You know, Stanford wasn't doing some like totally fucked up shit. Like they thought they were researching XYZ for, you like know. this big company. They didn't know it was to like torture people. Oh my God. Anywho, let's talk about Frank Olson. Yes. Frank Olson was was one of those guys that was secretly dosed by the CIA. So he was working at Fort Detrick in Maryland, which is like the headquarters of MK Ultra, which I don't think I had said. <laughs> I didn't say that yet. And he was also like a biological warfare guy. His focus was on like distributing biological germs like through the air. He develops a bunch of lethal Oh my God, lethal. He developed a range of lethal aerosols in small (laughs) containers. So like shaving cream or bug spray, it was actually like something that'll kill you. Oh my God. Um, Like he made a cigarette lighter, which gave out like almost instant deadly gas, a lipstick that would just kill you right when it touched your skin. Holy shit. I don't know what this is, a pocket spray for asthma sufferers, but I'm assuming that it's an Yeah, like one of the poofs. poofs. (laughs) That's, that's, yeah. We got the words. (laughs) Pocket Lytle. spray. <laughs> Lysol. <laughs> <laughs> but that in, induced pneumonia, like immediately. Like, like you'd use it and then you'd have pneumonia. So this was this guy's job. He worked for the CIA. How did um, it induce pneumonia? Who fucking knows? He started working for MK Ultra in 1953. He had a deputy, like so someone above him named Robert Lashbrook, and he worked directly under Sidney Gottlieb as well. So Olson's experiments basically focused on gassing and poisoning lab animals, and he hated it. When I got into the CIA poisoning business, I just wanted to kill people. Like, I think he was like a nerd, you know, like a yeah. germ nerd. And like he liked like, oh, doing that stuff. This is neat to figure out what does what. Exactly. And he started working for the CIA. It's a slippery slope because it's like all of a sudden he's working for this super top secret program that's doing super top secret fucked up stuff. He's contributing to like this fucked up stuff. If he was to like leave his job because he didn't like killing monkeys, he would be like a risk. So I think he kind of got in a, in a bad way. So there's actually a Netflix series called Wormwood that's about this, about his death. It's really good. It's like by the guy who did Thin Red Line. It's like a docudrama. But then they also have like reenactments, but it's like with real act. Kiefer, what's his name? Kiefer Sutherland? Yeah. I think he's in it. Um, I yeah, I saw two. it and I think it's on my like my list, but I just Dude, never actually watched it. you should watch it. it. So and I didn't finish it. I only watched the first two episodes because I actually like found out about it yesterday and I'm like, damn it, this would have been like really relevant for, for, for like the research I've been doing. As his son mentioned on that series that I watched some of. His father would have a successful day if all of his monkeys had died. He'd come to work in the morning and see piles of dead monkeys. He said, that messes with you. He wasn't Ugh. the right guy for that. You know, and then also, so before I go on, it's like, think about that. Like, that's the kind of stuff that you're seeing right. all the time. You know, you just feel like shit. And then, and then you're you a dosed. hallucinogen. Yeah. And you're just like, oh, my God. I'm evil. Uh, You You need to kill me. Help. (laughs) Right? I've definitely had like expansive kind of trips like that where I'm focusing on something that's like heavy and and dark and weird. Will anyone ever love me? Am I innately unlovable? You could really go down a fucking rabbit hole. And especially if you add to it that you like just killed 30 monkeys. Like, yeah, yeah, totally unlovable. I'm an evil human being. I deserve to die. Are you guys going to kill me? Cool. Well, guess what? Oh, no. It's happening. He he didn't only work in the U.S., but he worked in other countries as well. And both in the U.S. and here, he observed and monitored torture sessions of humans. So I'm going to get ahead of myself before I say this because it like kind of matters. There's all this information about like him and what's going on because he he died and it was ruled a suicide. Mm-hmm. 
Sure. Exactly. Why so, not? you know, so there's some some more information about him, you know, because all this shit happened. And that's why there's a documentary about him because it's like crazy story. Right. So I guess in CIA safe houses in Germany, Frank Olson witnessed, this is a quote, horrific, brutal interrogations on a regular basis. Detainees who are deemed expendable, again, um, <laughs> suspected spies or moles or like, you know, someone who's a security risk, were literally interrogated to death in experimental methods that combine drugs, hypnosis, and torture. Oh my um, God. And this was, again, an attempt to master brainwashing techniques and memory erasing. You know, so it's like if they're doing this to like the mental patients or whatever, and it's like more like a test, like what they were doing in Canada. And, that's and when they're really using up. it. Yeah. And he had like kids and a family. It's like, could you even imagine you like come I, home? It's like we were saying just like, oh, to like listen to a man potentially like beg for his life to be able to see his children again and then go home to your kids like, hey, honey, how yeah. was your day? It's too much. Now it's November 18th, 1953. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to this new day and age. So Sidney Gottlieb organized a retreat for some of the MK Ultra CIA guys. And it was something that he like did a lot. Frank Olson wasn't always invited, but he was this time. So on the second night of the trip, Sidney Gottlieb and also Robert Lashbrook, they spiked a bottle of Contro and poured glasses for the company. After 20 minutes, Gottlieb asked if anyone was feeling odd and a bunch of them said they were, at which point they were told that they'd been dosed with LSD. Um, not you feeling weird? Guess what? Get ready for six to eight hours of <laughs> extreme mental torture. It's just funny. It's like all these CIA dudes together, like tripping balls at a hotel. Oh, my <laughs> so God. Evidently, like even though a bunch of these guys like freaked the fuck out, eventually Gottlieb said they were all having fun and they were boisterous and laughing and they couldn't continue the meeting or engage <laughs> in sensible conversations. So and it shocked that, all of them into submission. The mood got better from there. <laughs> right. So Olson's boss was also there. His name is Victor Ruit. And he later called that night. The most frightening experience I've ever had or hoped to have. There's that. Yay. Um, oh, yeah. So obviously this really fucked Frank Olson up. Before this even happened, he really wanted to quit his job. And he just had like so much top secret information, like, you know, about like biological warfare. And right. He um, created a bunch of deadly things. He witnessed people like dying in front of his face. For about a week after this happened, like he was still like not feeling OK. And he went to his higher up and was like, I need help. <laughs> like, I'm not OK. Like ever since this happened, like I haven't been all right. So the CIA ended up sending him to a therapist on Long Island, along with his deputy, Robert Lashbrook, to meet this man named Dr. Harold Abramson, who was an LSD expert and worked for the CIA as like a medical collaborator, you know, like a staff doctor, I guess. So when they met, Olson told him like about the lake retreat that they went to and how ever since that happened, he was unable to work well. You know, I think he had even met with him one more time. Like he met with him one time before this and then was still like fucked up. And then they're like, OK, like you need to like go back and see him again. Right. Like shit is weird. Like he had an office on Long Island and then also an office in Manhattan. So I think the first time he went to Long Island, then he went to the one in Manhattan and then he agreed to go into the Maryland sanatorium just to like kind of get it together. And he was like, OK, yeah, that's a great idea. Like, I want to go <laughs> to the mental hospital. So him and his higher up, Robert Lashbrook, stayed in Manhattan and they got a room at the Statler Hotel. And that evening or I guess morning, he jumped out of the window oh. at 2.25 a.m. So, yeah, it was ruled a suicide. But the family was like, yeah, fucking right. So like even if he physically jumped out by himself, that's not a suicide because someone gave him something that made him crazy. Well, exactly. Well, and I don't think that he was high that night. Like, I think he, he wasn't high. Like, right. I think but like if like, you have like that kind of recurring issue totally past yeah. being high, then you fucked with your brain. Yeah. And also like who fucking knows? Like he's there with his boss. Like his boss could have like dosed him again, scared mm. him, you know, a bunch of stuff. Later, there's a bunch of interviews done later about this case because it's, you know, crazy. Was, yeah, totally. So they were able to interview the night manager at the hotel. And he says, in all my years in the hotel business, I never encountered a case where someone got up in the middle of the night, ran across a dark room in his underwear, avoiding two beds and dove through a closed window with the shade and curtains drawn. He made it through a window? So mm -hmm. he didn't open the window and step out. 
Mm -mm. Oh my God. The night manager thought it was so weird that he um, checked to see if there was any calls made from the room, you know, because he's like, this is really weird. And back at that time when it was like an operator, like with the switchboard or whatever, I guess like the operators eavesdropped a lot. (laughs) <laughs> so somebody did eavesdrop on their conversation bored is, it's one o'clock in the morning you're like well let's see what 217 is doing <laughs> right i know so someone in the room did make a phone call and it was a phone call to a number on long island which belonged to dr abramson yeah and the caller said well he's gone and abramson replied well that's too bad what yeah so there's that um the family had a second autopsy done in 1994 and they found injuries that had been sustained before the fall. Oh, my um, God. Yeah. So then there was like a bunch of conspiracy theories that he was assassinated. And I don't think that's a conspiracy theory. That I don't just either. sounds real. <laughs> right. It just sounds real to me, too. Like they're like, you're a flight risk. We shouldn't have given you drugs. You have to die. Like you're going to tell people we can't have that. Yeah. He was probably losing his shit. Like he was probably having some like I communicated with God and I need to make this right. I need to tell people what's happening. So there was like a, a whole And they probably like, bugged his house too. Like they were bugging everybody's house at that oh, point. I'm, so if I'm he sh- told his I'm wife sure. anything. Yeah. His family, they, they had a, a huge lawsuit and the Olsen family received a settlement of $750,000, got a personal apology from Gerald Ford and the CIA director at that time, William Colby. So in 1973, this program ended. Everyone was freaking out about Watergate. That's what was going on then. So the... CIA director at that time, Richard Helms, ordered that all the MK Ultra files be destroyed. He didn't do the best job. <laughs> in 1974, the New York Times alleged that the CIA had done like a bunch of illegal things here, you know, the experiments on U.S. citizens. Congress and uh, the Church Committee and the Rockefeller Commission all looked into like these activities. And there was still 20,000 documents that survived the whole like getting rid of documents. Which, That's a lot of documents like, for a giant purge. You did a bad job. <laughs> uh, someone would be fired if they weren't already dead. <laughs> right. So they like had just, they stored them in the wrong place. Like they put them in a financial records building instead and then oh they were discovered God. in 1977 and then they were fully investigated. Good. The public started hearing about what's happening in 1975 about like the drugs on people that didn't want it, like that they were trying to brainwash people. Um, and they also spoke about Frank Olson and how he died. And Sidney Gottlieb retired from the CIA two years prior to this. And when he was interviewed, he said that he like didn't remember anything. Mm-hmm. Or... I plead the not remembering. Right. Because so I was just so high stupid. all the time. Right. Just too much acid. I mean, I guess the good thing is in 1976, Gerald Ford signed an executive order for intelligence activities that prohibited experimentation with drugs on human subjects, except with the informed consent and writing and witness by a disinterested party of each such human subject. That's good. So, I mean, that's good. But did he know that that all this shit was happening before? You know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure, like, how top secret it was. Yeah, it makes me wonder, like, I feel like a president would know everything that was going on or like be able to learn anything that was going on. But how would you even know how to ask about this? Like, hey, you wouldn't happen to be drugging and torturing our own citizens, would you? Right. I just want to check in. I don't know. Yeah, (laughs) I'm not sure if if uh... the CIA isn't running a brothel, right? (laughs) (laughs) I know it's completely unlikely. I just want to check. Yeah, I guess like the way that they were doing it, like because they had these like phony like front companies and stuff, like the whole program was structured in a way where they were able to like finance this type of research without it drawing any sort of ethical questioning or negative public attention. Oh, my God. You know, just because of the way they presented it, I guess. Like shell companies, essentially. Uh Uh-huh. Like the psychology for mental health and wellness. Yeah, and I I said this already, but I just feel like I should say it again. It's just like such irony that the drug that the CIA thought was going to like help them control humanity actually like fueled like an entire generation of rebellion. That's it. That's all I got. Well, what have we learned? You cannot trust the government seriously. We already knew that, but now it's like we add the seriously on top of it. Yeah, the shit is fucked up. Now that you know about it, it's like watch movies and stuff and you'll, I mean, again, it's because I watched this fucking YouTube movie. Right. That was like, you know, it's called programming for a reason. What do they call what do they call the shows that are on? It's programming. Like, uh-huh. well, no, that's not why though. 
because but they did bring up like, the thing about Zoolander that I said and just like right. some other things where it's almost like they it put is this like, kind of information in there. It's like part it of our lexicon. Like, exactly. So it's like, well, yeah, I get it. That's something that the government does. Yeah, brainwashing. You know, like, totally, totally. Not like, right? oh, can you explain what's happening here? It's like, yeah, we are. We all know. Just like having so much violence in movies is like desensitizing us. Or, yeah. You know, I'm just like always borderline tinfoil hat. I think with I this know. one, it's easy, though. Well, this one isn't even tinfoil hat. Like this, no, actually this is just happened. an actual thing. Yeah, like this is real. This but to think that like it could possibly still be happening. It's really scary. You know, also thinking about like the, you know, how this originated in like concentration camps. Mm-hmm. I mean, and speaking of like the Japanese concentration camps, like is that internment camps? Like is that what that means? Because that makes me feel scared about like all of the ICE detention centers and stuff. I mean, that's essentially what's types, happening. Yeah. You know, they must be doing some weird shit like this there. Well, we already know that they certainly aren't like properly caring for people and definitely mm-hmm. not children. Mm-mm. So I, I really worry about what we're going to find out. Well, right, We already like, know that horrible, horrible, horrible things have been happening to these kids. Uh-huh. Well, Awful. it's like think about the, like the whole like expendable people and our like idiot president wants to deport people and he's not allowed to deport people. But like, you know what I mean? It's like you can go down this whole right. whole wormhole of just like, well, if this was happening and that. It's not <laughs> impossible. It's not impossible. And like there are people that we think are here to protect us that have no ethics that aren't here to protect us. Like it feels like nobody's here to protect us. Nobody's here to protect us. Nobody is definitely here to protect any of the people who are being detained. Exactly. It's heavy and it's fucked up and it's like reality. I think I am going to go like read a little bit more about Baron Trump and his uh, <laughs> fantastical time machine because that is like the kind uh, of shit. Yes. I That's can the vibe kind of with. lighthearted <laughs> shit that I'm here for. He's going to yeah. figure out a way to save us because he's a time traveler. <laughs> he's working from it's, the inside. You really need to look at it. You'll, you're going to be intrigued and amazed. Hell like yeah. That. But yeah, so it's like I got here like just all lighthearted, like <laughs> crazy. And then I'm like, wait, this is like really dark and weird and real. Yeah. Hold on a second. I don't like this anymore. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's heavy. I feel like you usurped my bummer hour title. What up? <laughs> Taking over my crown. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I thought this was going to be funny about like, I guess like Al Roker like froze during a taping. and Oh, I saw people, that where like, he went. Yeah. Well, it kind of just looked like he was being silly, but like nobody laughed. So he was like just holding for applause. (laughs) Right. And then nobody applauded. (laughs) And then the Internet's like, nobody likes me. Never mind. And there's like David Guetta, that video of him where he's like DJing. Then all of a sudden he's just like staring into the crowd. It's incredible. But same shit. It's like he's glitching or like. We have a thing in our family uh, called the Miller Stare. My grandfather's side of the family is the Millers and we all do it like everybody on that side of our family does it like we're we'll be talking we're totally engaged we're like doing the thing and then we're just like (laughs) sorry I zoned out (laughs) so we figured out because people ask you questions while you while you do that and if you say yes or no then you're either agreeing or disagreeing with something so we've determined that the best thing to say when you've zoned out completely is perhaps (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's like now we know we know that you've zoned out if you've said perhaps it's like our subtle way of saying i did not listen to a goddamn word you just said i love that. i checked out that is so funny <laughs> i was just watching on netflix love on the spectrum i actually finished it and it was fantastic i loved it so much but one of the girls on her date like part of her asd stuff was that and on the date like she kept being like oh sorry i zoned out oh sorry <laughs> she it was actually a very sweet show. I loved it. Mm-hmm. I think I'll watch that after I watch Wormwood and hate yeah, everything. Yeah, we'll have you to, like, should, cleanse it's my palate. Very, it's so sweet. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's also very sad, you know? Yeah. But it was also very sweet. Well, I hope it's more sweet than sad. That's all I want in my life. Well, it's sad in like a sweet way, you know, because like you you meet these people and you're like, oh, my God, I want you to find love. and. Mm-hmm. Like you deserve love. Yeah. Everybody and you does. Want it. Yeah, totally. It was very, very touching. I loved it. Well, thank you for leaving us with something to watch that will make us not hate everyone. Yeah, I loved <laughs> it. <laughs> you, did you just say you earned it? <laughs> no, but yeah. You made it this far. You've earned it. You earned this Have recommendation. Have some happy. <laughs> Show recommendations from 
the woman who watches The Bachelor and 90 Day Fiance. <laughs> <It's> like, <nobody laughs> and also MK Ultra documentaries <laughs> <laughs> and nothing in between. There's nope. no medium ground to your programming. <laughs> <laughs> Bringing it around. Hell yeah. Full circle. All right, guys. We're on summer break now. Yeah, we are on summer break. We will be uh, still doing shows every couple of weeks, but they will not be deep dives. They will be shallow dives. They will be like shallow end, like dip your toes in, maybe hang your legs over the side of the pool dives. Like, hey, here's a thing. Let's talk about it briefly and know nothing about it. Oh, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Like I am not going to know know anything. anything. (laughs) I'm going to be like, well, it sounds like it's this. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. See you next time. Yeah, miss you. (laughs) But yeah, that'll be for the next six weeks. And then we'll come back and we'll have more deep dives for you. And Mm -hmm. you will either love it or you'll cry. Sorry. Or you'll love it and cry. Or you'll hate it and laugh. (laughs) (sighs) Oh my God. Hate it and laugh. Mm -hmm. Like read it and weep. (laughs) Read it and feel nothing. Read it and feel the emptiness of our existence. That's how I feel right now. I'm kind of getting there too. Mm -hmm. I'm just like, how do you feel a feeling? No, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to look at dog photos. Have you ever listened to a squirrel? That's so funny. Nori was just asking me what a squirrel sounds like. I was like, I don't know. Like, (laughs) I've heard a squirrel. I also know what a fox says, by the way. (laughs) Says. Remember that song? What does the fox say? What they actually say is... Really? Yeah. Wow. Look up Fennec Fox or They're Scout so Scout Early Morning Madness is a Fennec Fox. And when he is woken up in the beginning of the morning and he's about to come out of his enclosure, he says <coughs> and like wags I his tail it. and his big ears like flop up and down. Oh, my God. Text it to me. So cute. I will. All right, you guys. This has been I Read a Thing. And you can listen to us wherever you stream podcasts. We are going on a little bit of a break. We will do shallow dives for the next six weeks, every other Friday. But Mm -hmm. we will still be here and we still love you. We don't want you to feel neglected. Mm -mm. You're the most important thing in our life. (laughs) Will you love us back? (laughs) Please. (laughs) Validate me. Mm. I know. I don't have social media anymore, so... I need to get that validation somewhere. Yeah, you're going to have to snail mail validate for <laughs> Emma. <laughs> well, we, It's going to be real like, creepy if that happens. <laughs> my God, right? Somebody just sends me like a, a heart or like, something. Oh, Jesus. They found me. A hundred likes. For a hundred likes. 500 views today. Like views of what? <laughs> oh, my God. Close the windows. <laughs> They're watching. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but you can still always uh, communicate with us via our Apple podcast reviews. And mm-hmm. when I say communicate, I mean say the things that you love about us. Yep. And if you have something negative <laughs> to say, you don't need to say anything. We're not interested. Mm-mm. I mean, we're interested in you personally and we love you and we want you to love us back. But like you don't need to verbalize everything that goes on in your brain. Mm-mm. Not Good vibes only. Yeah. Good vibes only. I love it. I love the forced positivity. Right? Good vibes only. I said good vibes, motherfucker. Read the pillow. I love it. All right, guys. We'll see you next time. Bye. Goodbye. Goodbye.